not only because we are church and singing but because of what he has done in our lives can you take a few seconds just to tell him the worthiness of God has nothing to do with our religion but what he has done in our lives his mercy his grace the forgiveness of our sin the peace that surpasses our understanding the joy that is our strength all that makes us say what is your name mighty God we praise your name apart from you almighty God we cannot do anything we are here because of you we are walking because of you we keep getting up because of you we are saying because of you we keep on believing because of you almighty god it is because of you we can even say you are lord and savior of our lives this morning we are praising the name above all names we love you jesus there is nothing and there is no place that we would rather be but in your presence at this very moment worthy is your name Jesus you deserve let's sing together worthy is your say worthy worthy is your name Jesus you deserve the praise worthy one more last time what is your name worthy is your name jesus you deserve the praise worthy is your name mighty god we give you honor this morning we praise your name we love you Jesus my prayer this morning is that you will speak to us oh Lord we want our hearts to hear from you the wounds to be healed we want your word to reveal the deepest secret that you want us to understand this morning we give you honor Almighty God as we believe Holy Spirit will breathe a breath of life to the word that is going to be spoken today we give you honor and glory in Jesus name we pray and the church say amen amen you may be seated in the presence of the Lord praise the Lord come on somebody praise the Lord the sound is beautiful everybody looks nice you will not regret to come this morning i'm fired up and ready to go to speak what god has prepared for us are you ready we are starting today i don't know how long this series will be but uh god has put a word in my heart and the title of the message or the series is my identity now i know most of us we have this assumption whenever we hear the word identity you have an assumption of the scripture that pastor is going to say this morning but one thing i want to tell you this morning we are going to go to a different direction apart from the normalities of scriptures that we are used to each and every sunday one thing i want you to understand every time you read the word of god every time you hear the word of god one thing for sure you have to be or you have to have assurance in your heart that god is at work and i know most of us maybe you have a great life you don't have any challenges for some of us do and some people maybe this morning you are at the crossroad of your life you have so many questions concerning the place 
that you are at this very point, still you have to know that God is at work. Praise the Lord. We're going this morning to read from one of the very or one of the most famous chapter in the Bible. And I want to warn you when you hear the chapter, don't think that your pastor did not have time to prepare. This really is what God wants you to hear. And I want you to pay attention, even though you are very, very familiar with this scripture. Tell your neighbor, be prepared. Psalms 23, verse 1 to 6. The word of God says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie, or he, make, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul, he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You've heard this passage for so long, many times in Sunday school. How many people you have never heard of Psalms 23? This is your first time. No. All right. So, the psalmist of Psalm 23 is King David. He's credited with writing almost, they say, 50% of the whole book of Psalms. He starts with saying these words. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Let me start from the verse 1a. David, he started this famous and beautiful. He was a poet. So he started very poetic. He's identifying God as a shepherd. And in order for David to identify God as a shepherd, David will be who? A sheep. Thank you so much. So he starts by saying, God is my shepherd and I shall not want. I want you to understand one thing. Before David was king, before David was anointed, he was a shepherd to the flock of his family. So he's speaking from experience. Him being a shepherd, he is identifying himself with God, meaning shepherd, he is my guide or my leader. At this very moment, David is king of Israel. Our point number one this morning is this. In order to know who you are, you will have to know who God is to you. In order for you to know who you are, you will or you must know who God is in your life. You've heard this statement so many times. I am still finding myself. Or you can talk about somebody else who's in a mess up situation. You say, ah, forgive them because they are still in... They are still finding themselves. And most of the time it's because anybody who does not know who they are, they don't know who God is in their own lives. And here David say, I know who God is in my life. God is my shepherd. He's, a, he's using a metaphor to, to relay his relationship with God. If I want my life to be successful, if I want my life to be right, I have to have a guidance and somebody that leads me in my life. 
Praise the Lord. In order to know Psalm 23, we have to know a relationship between a shepherd and a sheep. There is something very familiar concerning the church and the sheep. Bear with me this morning. Most of the places when you hear the word sheep in the Old Testament, the word sheep has been used in the New Testament. Even Jesus is called who? A lamb of God. Now, why did, do, does the Bible use the word sheep most of the time to refer to human beings? One thing that I've realized and as I was getting ready is sheep are very fearful creatures. They are very fearful creatures. They cannot go outside to eat by themselves. When I was growing up in my home, we had, we had uh, goats. Now, we used to take goats outside, here in Dar es Salaam, by the way. And the goats are very dependent. They are, I'm sorry, they are very independent. You can leave them outside, and around 6 a.m., here in Dar es Salaam, back in the day, they will come back by themselves home. Sheep, no. They are very dependent on who is guiding them. They are very afraid sometimes of strangers. They are very afraid of darkness. So David says, I know who I am. I cannot operate by myself. I need somebody to guide me. God is my shepherd. Come on, somebody. I know most of you are good. Your life is good. You're getting your salary. You don't have any sickness. You don't have any trials. This is message is not for you. This message is for us. Some of us need God because we are in a situation that need God. Sometimes we are fearful. Sometimes we don't know what to do. Sometimes we don't know what to pray. David say what? The Lord is my shepherd. Come on, somebody. So the relationship between the shepherd and the sheep goes this way. The primary responsibility of a shepherd is to guard the flock. In other words, to protect the flock. Not only that, to go and look for green pastures, to look for food. Where are these sheep going to eat today? Number two, are we going to go through rocks and valleys? Are we going to go through sunny and rain? Not only that, all the time, whenever there is a place to go, the shepherd will go outside first. And whenever you see, even when you go to YouTube, you watch those videos, if it's Australia, or if it's the Middle East, if it's New Zealand, if it's Ireland, all those places with gazillions of sheep, shepherd will go outside first. And then the sheep will follow. They will say, God is my shepherd, and I shall not want. Not only that, the shepherd's responsibility is to make sure that every sheep is accounted for at the end of the day. Not only that, to make sure if there is wound, to bind the wound of the sheep. My question to you is, who is God to you? David said, the Lord is my shepherd. Who is guiding your life. See, David didn't say the Lord is our shepherd. He put it very personal. He said the Lord is my shepherd. Who is God to you? Is he your God or he is our God? If he's our God, then you know what you will do? You will find God at church. On Sundays. If he's your God personally, he'll be your God on Monday. He'll be your God on Tuesday. He'll be your God on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, in the morning and night. The Lord will be your personal leader and guider. See, sometimes we read the word of God and then we see the word shepherd. We're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. David was like using shepherd. And then you end up right there. 
See, shepherd back in the day, even now, it's a kind of big deal. And now, they use shepherd in terms of a person and the dogs. How many of you have seen those clips? A person and dogs guiding the sheep. Because they don't know what to do and where to go. They don't know their way back home. Even if you take the same road all the time and you leave the sheep to come back by themselves, they will not be able to do that. That tells us something. Why God allowed David to write Psalms 23? Most of the time, we don't know what we do. Most of the time, we don't know our way back to God. Unless he's our personal savior, we can go back to God and say, God, I need you in my life. I need you to redirect me back to you. See, sometimes we're afraid to go back to God and say, God, I am far away from you at right this very moment. My actions, my words, even my heart is far away from you. God, help me get back to you. We do afraid because we are not personally related to God. We are not personally related to our loving Father. When we see or when we think about God, we're thinking about this figurehead that is so mean and angry and mad at you. Do you know how many people sin in a day? Can I tell the number that will shock you? Everybody. But how many times do we go, go to God and say, God, forgive me of my sin this very day. See, sometimes in scriptures, we love to believe that Christians are giants. Right? Okay. All right. All right, all right, all right. See, if we are who we thought we are in terms of we love God, we have this faith, oh, I'm not going to be moved, then you don't need God. When we say those words of faith, guess what? We are saying those words because our dependency is on God. We are not saying those words because we are so strong and we are so faithful and we are not afraid. No, we are saying the words of faith because our dependency is on see David is king at this very moment he did not identify himself as David the king of Israel uh -uh. he identified himself as sheep the most powerful person in Israel at this time the most influential person in Israel at this time the most wealthier person in Israel at this very moment he says I am a sheep and he is leading he is my shepherd now think about this David says the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want what was David need as he is the king of Israel let me ask you for a minute he is the king of Israel and you know king owns everything about the country do you know the wealthy of the royal family of England their money comes from the taxes of the people of England. Once you are born in royalty, everything that belongs to the government, they have their portion, is theirs. They will never work for the rest of their lives. Now, let me ask you this. If you hear somebody from the royal family says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Your question will be what? What is your needs? You have everything that you need. You have your planes, you have your trains, luxury trains, right? You have everything, palaces and everything that you need. What is your need? Hello. The need resides in your heart. The deepest place where most of us hide and pretending to be these great folks. We put our spiritual makeup and we walk outside telling people we are okay through what we do, through what our dresses, through our faces, through our income, through our homes. We pretend to be okay and we are not okay. And at this very moment you hear Psalms 23 like, why did I come to church today? Pastor, really? Psalms 23? Of all the scriptures you are preaching today about Psalm 23, yes, because you have a need in your heart. And you have a want in your heart. And you don't want God to deal with your want because you are telling us you're okay, but you are not okay. 
David need God. And he's the king of Israel. And here I am. I'm pretending to be okay. Just because I don't want people to see me as this weak person. You're not weak. You're human. Adam messed up for us. And Eve. See, it, it, I hate to say this every Sunday. The richest person in the world, the second or the third richest person in the world, the fourth rich and richest person in the world, all of them have been divorced. The richest person in the world at this very moment is a single person with a bunch of kids. I know you're looking at me like, ah, it doesn't matter, but he's rich. No. There is problem in a, in a human heart. Human heart. Jeremiah 79 says what? The heart of a man is the most deceitful of all things. I wish Jeremiah 17 would have said a heart of a sinner. Uh-uh. It says a heart of a person. So if a heart of person is the most deceitful thing, and the word of God says, who can know it? And he continues to say, I, God, knows all the heart and judges all the heart. So David says this, and I believe with all my heart every time you see scriptures, God wanted David to write because David at this, at this very moment did not need any tangible stuff. He did not need any tangible things. He did not need any car. He did not need any house. He did not need any wife. He was okay. He was set. At this time, I don't know if we had two wives or three. But he was set. He did not need any physical security. He was set. He did not need any, any, any credential. He was set. He did not need any praise. He was set. But the word of God says he had want. And if you have want in your heart, the cure is what? A shepherd. A shepherd. Someone who will guide you. Someone who will direct you. Somebody who will comfort you. Somebody who will tell you, don't go this way, come this way. That is the shepherd. That is our God. See, it has to come a time where we have to pretend to be okay. You've heard this statement. I don't know who said it. But it's okay not to be okay. It is. It is okay not to be okay. Jesus says what? In this world, you will have what? Tribulation. But he continued to say, be of good cheer because I, Jesus, have overcome the world. So he started to say this. The Lord is my shepherd. And because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In other words, David says this. I will not be dissatisfied because the Lord in my shepherd. In other words, I decide to not desire more than what the Lord my shepherd gives. Come on, somebody. Make a choice to not desire anything other than the what Lord provides. He continues to say, Verse 2, he makes me to lie down in the green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. There are th four things they say that sheep will need all the time. They say this, because sheep are timid, they will not lie down if they are afraid. By the way, I've been in English class for a long time ago. They don't have plural for sheep. Sheep is sheep. So forgive me by saying ships. Sheep are timid. They will not lie down if they are afraid. Because they are social animals, 
They will not lie down if there is friction among the sheep. They say flies or parasites trouble them, they will not lie down. Finally, if the sheep are anxious about food or hungry, they will not lie down. So how do they rest? They rest their rest comes because the shepherd has dealt with number one, fear, friction, flies, and famine. So when he says he makes me to lie down in green pastures, that means God has dealt with the fear of David. If there is any friction in his heart, God has dealt with friction in his heart. If there is any, any, any spiritual parasite, God has dealt with it. You read the second book of Timothy, chapter 1, 7, Lord, the word of God says, God has not given us spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. First Corinthians 10, 13 says this, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under under it. Psalms 32, 6, 7 says this. Surely when the mighty water arise, they will not reach me. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. We have been in seven days today of prayers. And I said all week that it's very easy for us to finish praying and then go back to business as usual, the way we were. Because our heart is troubled and we want to go to solve, or we want to solve issues of our hearts with tangible stuff, with tangible solution. David said this in verse 3. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The word restore from the original language of Greek is, David is saying, he brings me back to himself. Or he quickened my spirit. I came to watch this video and it shocked me a little bit. I think somebody sent it online as a, as a meme. But I went to search that video on YouTube and uh, it changed my perception about shepherds. Sometimes God, when they lay back on their back, they cannot get back up. It's almost like they are overwhelmed with whatever is going on in their lives they cannot get up, and if you don't help them get back up, they will die. You, the feet up and the back on the ground. So in my mind, the first time when I watched the video, I was like, maybe this, the sheep is playing with other sheep. But I did not know that's a condition of the sheep. I don't know what type of that disease is. But the verse 3, most theologians believe that David was talking about this kind of helpless situation where the sheep will lay on the ground and will need to be resuscitated by the shepherd. In other words, bring back life to that sheep and make it go to be the person or the, the animal used to be. Sometimes God will restore our lives and will bring us back after we go or we went astray. Maybe it is our sinful life. Maybe it is our disbelief. We read a few weeks ago of the scripture of the man in the book of Mark who took his son to uh, disciples of Christ. And the disciples are not able to pray and cast out the demons from the boy. And Jesus cast the demon out and the boy was free. That father told Jesus, Jesus, I believe. Help me with my, with my unbelief. Sometimes we have to go to God and say, God, I want you to restore my faith back to you. Restore my heart back to you.
I want to continue to believe you. See, the belief is something very strange. Your identity is not what I see at this very moment. Have you met somebody at work, right? Hi, hi, what's your name? My name is Susan. Oh, hi, my name is John. And then, lo and behold, one day there is a wedding. You guys meet at the wedding. And you look at that person, they changed. Everything about them is different. The makeup is different. The suit is different. Sometime you pass by them and they'll be like, hey, so-and-so, how you doing? I'll be like, oh, I did not recognize you because you have makeup. It hasn't happened to you. It happens to me so many times. But that is not your identity. Your identity is not your bank account. I hate to say that I'm married. My identity is not my marriage. I have two kids. My identity is not my kids. I am Chaga. My identity is not in Chaga. I know you're asking me, Pastor, what is my identity? It's your belief system. Your identity is your belief system. And your belief system is being revealed with what you say. And then it's being verified by your action. That is your identity. I'll repeat one more time. Your identity is your belief system. Your belief system is being revealed by what you say. And what you say is being verified by your action. So when David says, the Lord is my shepherd, that was belief system of David. And his action backed him up because he trusted God wholeheartedly. What is your identity? See, sometimes we love especially in the age of social media, we love to put our, or to, to identify ourselves with tangible stuff, with tangible things. But I have bad news for you. If you put your identity in tangible things, those things will be taken away. They have an end. Tangible things. Money. Wealth, recognition, influence. If that is my or your identity, there is an end to tangible things. But if you put your identity in spiritual things, which is your relationship with God, that identity lasts forever. Praise the Lord. Verse 4, it is very it's a very popular verse. The word of God says, Yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comforted me. The first three verses, David is talking about the identity of who he is and God. Verse 1, verse 2, it's talking about God providing. Verse 3 also, it's talking about God providing. And then he switched to a dark note in this beautiful Psalms in verse 4. Yeah, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comforted me. Some theologians believe this to be a place where uh, the good Samaritan uh, helped a person who was attacked, but they say these valley in the Middle East were very narrow valleys, and they are very dark valleys. They had animals, and they had thieves or bandits. So David, he's painting a picture of difficulties of life as someone who's passing by the darkest part of the valley. He says, even though I walked through the valley, but he says something very profound. He didn't say, even though I walked through the valley of death. He said, even though I walked through the valley of the shadow of death. In other words, David was saying that I am passing in a very difficult situation that is temporary. 
It is the darkest moment. Maybe I am overwhelmed, but it is just something that is temporary. The problem for some of us is when the darkness overwhelms you, we tend to think that it is over. When you pass through the valley of the shadow of death, you think that is over and God said already, it's over. I have good news for you this morning. The shadow is just temporary. Not only that, as I was reading the word of God, I realized something that is very strange. When you are in a dark place, you're not supposed to see shadow. How many of you have been in a very dark place and then you saw a shadow? How many of you? Not a single person. But when you see a shadow, it's a sign of what? It's a sign of what? It's a sign of light. Come on, somebody. So if you're in a dark path, and you see a shadow, that is a great news that Jesus is with you in the darkest place. Because you cannot see a shadow in the darkness. And whenever appears shadow, whether on your left or your right, it's a good news and it's a time for us to celebrate that there is someone with you in the darkest hour of your life. That's one thing. Then the next thing is, he says, the valley of the shadow of death. Think about what Jesus did at the Calvary. He says shadow of death. And at this very moment, he was way before Jesus died on the cross for us. If you read the word of God, the word of God says, uh, the last enemy to, de to be defeated will be death. But since Jesus died for us, death has no power anymore in our lives. I don't know about you, but some people are very afraid when they hear the word death. Some people are very afraid when they hear somebody pass away. But we should not be afraid because it's the shadow and the word of God says those who believe in God will not die in terms of spiritual death. Our physical body, maybe yes. But we will live forever because of what Jesus did at the Calvary. Praise the Lord. Sometimes when you go through difficult situation, very difficult situation, when pain cuts too deep. We tend to think that the valley of the shadow of death is your final destination. Most of the time we think this is it. This is my final destination. I am done. But this morning I want to encourage you. Sometime when you go through the deepest or the difficult part of your life, the valley of the shadow of death is a highway to, towards your final destination. I know right now you will not believe a word what I say. Especially if you are not through with the valley of shadow of death. And some of us have never been there. Some of us are just getting out of the valley of shadow of death. So, when you are going through a difficult situation, when you are going through a disappointment, a frustrating uh, circumstances, know this, that where you are, however difficult that challenges a place of struggle, a place of disappointment, it is not your final destination. Number one. Number two, you are not by yourself. David says, for you are with me. How was David able to navigate through the most difficult times of his life? And if you've read the book of Kings, the first Kings, second King, uh, first Chronicles, second Chronicles, and you see the life of David. 
when his son overthrew his government, when everybody in Jerusalem rejected him, but he was able to cling unto God. See, David is not writing Psalms 23 just to write Psalms 23. God does not allow, or he did not allow, or he does not allow scripture to be written just to be written as a poem, as a beautiful sermon on Sunday. No. In this life, the Bible is preparing us to overcome and to trust God in varieties of situation that we will go through. If you are listening to sermon in any place that you will be, if it's a seminar, if it's a church, if it's a Bible study, don't listen to a sermon as, oh, pastor is preaching. What is he going to preach about today? He's preaching about Psalm 23. If you are somewhere else and they're preaching about Job, if you are somewhere else, they're preaching about Abraham. Every time the word of God is preached is about our lives, our situation, our challenges. The things that are difficult for us. And the word of God does not want us to give up. The only thing that the enemy wants you to do is to lay down and give up and say it's over. But God wants us to realize that we are not on our own. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Verse 5 says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You are anointing my head with oil. My cup runs over. David painted a picture of God with him from verse 4 in the valley, in the most difficult situation, in a place where he's overwhelmed with pain, with sicknesses, with disease, with enemies. And then he continued to say in verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. Without departing in the valley, David is painting a situation of God preparing a banquet for him in the presence of our enemy. Now, there is Something that caught my attention. On verse 4, he says, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And then he continues to say, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. So, David is telling us something very personal. The presence of God will not sometime eliminate your troubles, but will eliminate the fear of your troubles. Okay. See, the church want God, pastor, to say, God will give you everything. I'm not that pastor. Listen. <laughs> David says this. Ah, <laughs> let me read it one more time. Verse 4, he says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Right? Are we together, church? Are we together? I will fear no evil, for you are with me. But the, 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 the shocking thing is on verse 5, the enemies are still right there. So God is with David, but the enemy are with David. What changed? Because the presence of God eliminates fear in the heart of David. In other words, when we walk with God, God will deal with our fear even though the situation is still there. When we are praying and we're waiting for God to answer our prayer, God will deal with our fear. Even though the enemy is there, but God says, listen man, I'm going to remove your fear so that you can walk in the valley of the shadow of death. And the bonus thing is, I'm going to make a banquet. And I'm going to make your enemy watch you as you enjoy the food that I prepare. Come on, somebody. But over here, we want to know, Pastor, you say, so, so what do you mean? So the fear is going like in the enemy and me back. See, some of us, we want God to remove the haters, the people who don't, we don't like. 
we, we want God to eliminate them. So, no. He ain't going to do that. He's not going to remove. See, haters will, <laughs> haters will be right there. That's the good news for me. I don't know about you. Because God wants you to keep trusting him. You want haters to be gone. You want those people don't, don't like you to be gone. Oh, so and so, I don't like them. I don't like this person. I don't like that. I don't. So who are you? Are you going to live? Are you going to be in an island in this world? God will be like, no, 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 no. Listen, listen, listen. Don't worry about your enemy because I am. Come on, somebody. If God is with you, why are you afraid of your enemy? So that means your enemy is greater than your God. Right? Uh-uh. See, God does this because he wants us to trust in him more than we are scared and afraid of our problem. See, sometimes we, 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 we focus on what is wrong rather than focus on for God or focus on God who's with us. I focus on what I lack. I focus on what I don't have. And I forgot to focus on God who is with me and he is carrying me through my life. And you know why do we do that? Because if I go back to identity, because sometimes I think that the identity that I have, the influence that I have, the money that I have, the job that I possess, the marriage that I am in will fix my issue. I didn't have an English word for this, but Swahili word is subutu. <laughs> it ain't gonna change anything. See, the good news or the bad news I have for you is this. In the valley of shadow of death, you're gonna walk by yourself. You can't take your friend in the valley of shadow of death. You cannot take your mama, you cannot take your wife, you cannot take your husband. You're gonna walk either by yourself or with God. Pastor, what do you mean? Do you tell everybody about your business, deepest issue of your heart? How many of us? You open up, you go to salon, you're like, guess what? Yeah, I cried yesterday, all night. You can't believe it. He left me. How many of you do that? Especially guys, we don't do it. If a girl, or your friend, or your fiance was supposed to get married, left you for guys, you won't say it. Am I lying to you? You're not going to open to Charles. Oh, Charles, man, my heart is broken. I'm crying inside. You're not going to do that. You're like, Gideon, how are you doing? I'm, I'm blessed and highly favored. And you're crying inside. She left you. Like, that's an example. Gideon is single, so don't worry about it. We don't open up to anybody about the deepest issue of our hearts. And that is the deepest place that we are. We are supposed to go to God. But most of the time we think that I can take my friends. I can take my wife. I'm married. I can, I can take my kids with me. No, you can't. You haven't seen people who are lonely and they have everything in their lives. Married with, with husband or wife, with kids, with cars, with everything. Or you single and your life is good. You get paid and everything is good. People say you're cute. But you still go through the valley of the shadow of death. And the bad thing is because you're not focusing on God, you, you, you go by yourself, but you, you're not by yourself. God is like, hey, I'm, I'm with you. And you're trying to navigate the valley by yourself. David said this. You prepare table before me, listen, in the presence Of my enemy. This is the Bible. This is not me. Sometimes you will fast. You will fast and pray. You will fast and pray. You will fast and pray. And you pray wrong prayers. How come God, the enemies are still there? And God will be like, uh, I am right there with you. Like, no, God, I want you to remove this and that. And like, no, 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 no. Don't worry about that. Focus on me. That's what God wants. And once you are able to focus on God, guess what? The enemy is nothing to you anymore. Let me tell you something. I know some of you are like, Pastor. Okay. Listen. Listen. In other words, God is saying this through David. That 
He will provide to us in the darkest moment he will provide to us what others enjoy in their comfortable places. In your darkest moment, right? In your deepest cry or situation or environment of your life, God will provide it for you even more than what you see people enjoy in the world. Now, let me tell you why that doesn't make sense for you now. As you are in the valley of the shadow of death, God will provide for you the same or more than them, but your heart is filled with peace and the joy of the Lord. Their heart is spiritually bankrupt. What you see them enjoying inside of them, bankrupt. See, sometimes we're like, God, eliminate, but those you see them, they seem to enjoy, but you don't know their lives. Just yesterday, I received this testimony, and I was shaking, and I was like, God, why are you giving me this testimony on Saturday? One friend of mine we were talking to, and he said, Pastor, I need prayers for my friend. And he said, because he from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, he's dependent on alcohol 24-7. But if you see the person coming over here or you meet them somewhere in Money City, you will not know. Very nice car. Great job. Beautiful home. And I was like, why are you t asking, them, why are you telling me it's Saturday? Why? But God was like, that's your testimony for tomorrow. You see that person drive their car. You will be tempted to be God. I want their lives. I want to be like them. That is life. How many times you've seen people beg, man, that's life. How many times? You look at their Instagram, they're in Dubai, next time in Australia, next time in Japan. You beg, my goodness, private jet. I've never been in a private jet. First class all the time. What do you say? That is life. And God is like, do you don't want to walk in their shoes? Somebody a few weeks ago, I don't know if I say this Sunday, last Sunday. He said, Pastor, how are you? And he told me, Pastor, when I grow up, I want to be like you. I told him, you've never been in my shoes. Sometimes it's easier for us to compare our lives with somebody else or even to, to look at them and be like, ah, I'm better than them. But deep in our heart, our hearts are far removed from God. See, David is bringing us, he's, he's giving us clarity of life. I told you this from the get-go. At this very moment, David is king of Israel. So you tell me, if you are king of Israel, what valley of shadow of death are you going through? What was the valley of David? You read the book of Kings, you'll be shocked how many, how many times David was crying to God and he is in the palace. Sometimes palace is not worthy if you don't have God. Good thing David had God. Now, I am not here this morning to tell you that you should enjoy to live in a miserable life. Absolutely not. That is not the message. The message is who do you identify with every day? David is saying the Lord is my shepherd. And the verse 1, 2, 3 is a great life. He's talking about great life. Verse 3, 4, I'm sorry, verse 4, 5, 6, he's talking about tribulation. So he gave us 50% of his life, great life. And then he gave us 50% of his life, a messed up life. But in all those two situations, he's saying, the Lord is my shepherd. In great times, the Lord is my shepherd. In messed up time, the Lord is my shepherd. That should be your take this morning that, hey, I might have a great life, but I will still be with God. I might have a messed up life, but I will still be with God. Come on, somebody. Praise the Lord. There's something that I want to say before I finish. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. The question is this. Why was David so 
confident. See, when you say the Lord, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, that is some confident statement. Why was he confident? The answer is this. Because David was aware of where he was. I don't want you to miss this. Because David was aware of where he was. He was aware of where he came from. He was aware of where he is. And he was aware of where he is going. Some of you missed it. Okay. He was acutely aware of his journey. This is what I mean. You have to realize the valley of the shadow of death it is not your final destination. Your final destination is where the shepherd reside. Come on, somebody. The word of God in the book of Philippians 3.20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. If the final destination is here, what is the use for us to have relationship with God? The final destination is where the shepherd resides. Sheep all the time. At the end of the day, you know where they go? They go with the shepherd where the shepherd resides. And we should be eagerly await to go to heaven someday. Okay. I know the church will miss this. Pastor. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. I need to get married before I go to heaven. I, mm -mm. I need to make money, pastor, before I go to heaven. Pastor, I need to be big in this city before I go to heaven. How will they know I love God? Eh? You see how, how quiet the church is? When I say the final desti destination is where the shepherd is, it's like, mm -mm, not that. Well, you, you have to have a choice then. To live like a worldly person, or to live like a son and daughter of God. Now, when, when, when you know that this, <laughs> your final destination is heaven, it doesn't mean you're going to live a miserable life, you'll not drive a nice car. Who, who lied to you? That will give you peace in your heart, though. Because, again, you don't want to be a successful person with a messed up heart. Trust you me. Because you will have so many tools to cure your heart with messed up stuff. Okay, I missed it again. Why, why drug abuse is so prevalent to people who are rich in the countries that are wealthier? Because they have money to buy drugs and every kind of thing that will numb the pain of their lives. There is nothing wrong with having money. There is nothing wrong with be being rich. There is nothing wrong with being famous. But if I ask them, or if I ask you, what is the reason for you to be successful? What will you say? Do you know your final destination? After everything is said and done, where are you going? And if the answer is I don't know, my goodness, what you have is of no use for your spirit but if the answer is yes then everything that you possess you deserve to have it because you will serve god with your money will serve god with your possession you will serve god with your influence and your life will have meaning here and the world to come i really really want to repeat this one more time you have to realize that the valley of the shadow of death, the problems that you are going through, the challenges of your lives, they are not your final destination. Your final destination is where God is. Praise the Lord. As I'm finishing, the last thing I want to tell you is this. David was able to to be confident because he had reference of God goodness in his life. And sometimes it's, it's hard for us to see God's mercy ahead of us, God's goodness ahead of us. But David had to look back 
and remember what the Lord has done in his life. As he is reaching on verse 5, 4, 5, and 6, you can see David rely on who God is on verse 1, 2, and 3. So sometime in our lives, we have to have a reference of God's goodness in our lives. If I ask you, how many things has God done in your life? Sometimes we don't remember. It is not because God has not done anything. It's because maybe we think those things were smaller things. See, David is talking about God providing shelter. David is talking about God providing protection. David is talking about God being with him. And for David, that was a big deal. For us, not so much. If I ask you, what is miracle to you? How many of us will say presence of God? Mm, I doubt. Do you believe that presence of God is a miracle in your life? Mm, you say that because I said it. See, David says, God is, a sh God is my shepherd, I shall not want. He, lies, he lays me down in the green pastures, in the water. He's talking about providence. And for the lack of better language, it's trivial stuff. See, if today, right here, right now, if I say we have a few minutes, I, give, uh, I will give you a few minutes to testify of God's goodness. And then Esther comes here and say, I'm super thankful. And she starts crying. She said this week, God gave me 2,000 shillings. I was able to buy food. Everybody's like, so why is she crying? 2,000 for food? Is that a miracle? Oh my goodness. Next. We want the testimony of cars. Food. What is food? David, what does David say? Read, 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 read Psalms. He says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall know what. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. That's the last thing that he said. He leads me in the paths. Of righteousness, watch this, for his name's sake. What God does in your life, it's not because of you, it's because of his glory. And sometimes that God does not provide to you because you want to take glory from what God has done in your life. Yeah, God has done it to you and you, like, you want people to look at you like, mm -hmm. did you see my car? Did you see? Did you see my picture? I was in South Africa. Did you see? I, I went, I'm going to Japan next week. Did you see? Did you see? I was promoted. There's nothing wrong with testifying, but God is doing something in your life for his name's sake. Not because of you. And sometimes you don't get it because you think it's about you, but it ain't about you. Tell your neighbor it's not about you. I'm going to read one more time because sometimes... We read as pastor, they, yeah, this pastor, they don't like what we have, okay? Verse 1, 2, 3. He says, he leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Before he goes to the valley, he wanted to show that the providence of God, the blessings of God is because of God's glory and not yours or mine. So sometimes we... You read the, the, the New Testament, the word of God says we pray amiss and we don't receive because we do pray for our selfish reasons. Again, this morning, I want you to live in this place. Know that God will give you the desires of your heart. And the word of God says in the book of Lamentation, God doesn't like to torture you. In Swahili, it says better. Mungu apendi kumtesa monadam kwenye kitabu cha mombolezo. So God will bless you. God will give you desire of your heart. God will answer your prayers. But for his glory. Praise the Lord. As you are standing on your feet this morning. I wanted really for us to understand the providence of God. Not only the providence of God, I wanted us to understand that even in the darkest hour of our lives, 
the company, the presence of the Lord is the miracle that we seek or we should seek the most. Not only that, the presence of God in our lives will eliminate fear. Even though sometimes the enemy will remain, but the fear will be gone because of God's presence. You can stand on your feet this morning. As we are finishing our last day of praying this morning, I want us to go home today with the thought and belief and the new identity knowing that God is all I need. And I choose to believe, not only to believe, I choose not to want something that is not from him. Because he's my shepherd, I will only receive and I will only desire what he only provides. My prayer this morning is that we will realize we are not alone. Don't cry in the valley of the, in the, valley of the shadow of death by yourself. Don't make it your permanent home. Don't make it your residence. God's hand is here this morning to lift you up. I want to pray for those people who do not know God this morning. If you are here or if you are watching us online. The Lord can only be your shepherd if you have given your life to him. And if you are here. And you say, I just want to give my life to God. This morning, you can lift up your hand. And I will pray with you and the church. We can accompany them in this short prayer. Say, dear Heavenly Father, I come to you. I ask you to forgive my sins. Help me to walk in your ways. I want to be guided and led by you. You, God, as a shepherd, and I, am, and I as your sheep. Thank you for saving me, and thank you for forgiving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If there is someone who needs prayer this morning, you say, Pastor, I just, I just want to follow God wholeheartedly. I've not really identified myself as a sheep. And I, I have not really identified myself. I, I haven't identified God as shepherd, a leader of my life. I want to be a follower. Sheep means to follow. I want to be follower of God. No matter what circumstances arises in my life. No matter what type of blessings I have in my life, I want to follow God wholeheartedly. If, if, if that's you, you can come forward and we will pray together. Or you can stay right there and we can pray together. But I didn't want to finish prayers, seven days of prayers, and our hearts go back to the way we used to be, not trusting God live in fear maybe God will answer me maybe he will not but I want to pray with you this morning dear heavenly father you see the heart of your children in the depths of our thoughts where no one can reach the thoughts the pain the disappointment mighty God I pray that you will go right there in a place where it seems as the deepest valley accompanied with the shadow of death. I pray, Almighty God, for a spiritual healing. I pray, Almighty God, that you will lift us up this morning 
and that we will arise and scream and yell and say, Yes, you are my shepherd. I shall not want you. are my leader. You are my God. I will follow you wholeheartedly. Come rain, come sun, come flood, I will follow you. When I'm successful, when I'm not, I will follow you. When I'm well, when I'm not, I will follow you. When I have or I have nothing, I will follow you. That is the prayer of our heart this morning. That is the prayer of my heart this morning. Yes, Lord, I give you honor and glory. Jesus, this morning, bless each and every soul. As every one of us is about to leave. And when we're going to give offering, mighty God, I pray for you to bless each and every person. Bless their hearts. Mighty God, bless their work, their business. Bless what they do. Family, children, plans and vision and dreams. Let it be blessed by you, mighty God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.